It's a joy and a privilege to be worshiping the Lord with you this morning. Henrietta, also known as Hetty Green, was a young woman in the 1860s who was raised in a Quaker family in Massachusetts. Her family was very successful in the whaling industry, and the family became very wealthy, and Hetty took on the work of family accountant for personal and household expenses. She grew up in the best schools. She married another wealthy man from New York. And at the end of her father's life, she received a $5 million inheritance when her father passed away. That money continued to make interest, and Hetty was good at making money. Throughout the late 1800s and the early 1900s, she gave many loans to businesses, banks, and even to the city of New York. Yet even through all this lending, she still became known as a stingy lady. She would argue with the housekeeper about grocery expenses. Uh, For special events, she would use chip glassware instead of their best china. Another story stated that when her son Ned hurt his knee in a sledding accident, uh, she and him dressed up in old ratty clothes so that they could use the free clinic instead of paying for hospital fees. She took to heart her dad's advice to never owe anything to anyone, not even a kindness, which didn't endear her to very many people. Through her life, she made lots of money. Her estate was valued at over $100 million when she died, and she passed that money on to to her two children. But at the end of her life, the Guinness Book of World Records gave her the title of World's Greatest Miser. Now, the attitude that was missing was the attitude of generosity. Now, let's contrast that with another person who lived about 50 years prior to Hetty, William Colgate. And William was a young man who had immigrated from England with his parents to the state of Maryland. And at the age of 16, his dad said, you got to go. I can't afford to support you any longer. Now, if he ate like I I did when I was 16 or some of you 16-year-olds do, I understand that, Right? So he packed up everything, and he left for New York City to start his own soap-making business. Now, when this country boy arrived at this big city, he found it hard to get work, so he became an apprentice at a soap-making business. And he learned the trade, and in a few years, he started his own soap-making business. And that business grew and kept growing and became very successful. Now, through this time, William became a Christian. He came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He married, and he had three sons. And this country boy from Maryland turned New York City businessman kept giving away money that he made to the local church where he was a deacon, to other Christian endeavors, and to people who needed it. He became known for his generosity, and their home had a reputation for being warm and welcoming. Throughout his life, Colgate contributed his success in business and ministry to the principles and truths taught in the Bible. Now, at a base worldly level, both these people, Hetty Green and William Colgate, looked very successful. They used, one could even argue that they used their wealth for the common good. But there was a huge difference in how they did it and the attitude that was displayed. Hetty Green always used her money to get more, where William Colgate gave away his money and used it to serve God. So this is what I want to talk about this morning, our attitude of generosity. We'll look at why we're not generous, the sinful attitudes that affect this lack of generosity, the biblical attitude of generosity, and how to actively practice this in our lives. So what would your family say about you? Would they say you're a generous person? How about your coworkers or your neighbors or others around you? Are you thought of as generous like William Colgate or a miser like Hetty Green? See, our our attitude of generosity is directly tied to our faith in God's goodness to us. So let's look to God's Word. Please open your Bibles up to 2 Corinthians 9, and please stand for the reading of God's Word. 2 Corinthians 9. For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints, For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I have sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case, so that, as I was saying, you may be prepared. 
Otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever." Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only, fulfilling, is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all, while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father God. You are the giver of all good things. You have blessed us richly more than we deserve. Lord, may we use what you have given us to be generous for your kingdom. Lord, bless our time this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of us here this morning may be thinking, generosity can be hard to define. The dictionary definition of generosity is showing a readiness to give more of something than is strictly necessary or expected. Let me say that again. Showing a readiness to give more of something than is strictly necessary or expected. Some of you this morning may not know the story of how this church house and this property came to be here. In God's goodness to us, he allowed some of us here this morning to give generously to buy this land and build this house. Andrea and I first came here to to Christ the Word in 2009. We'd moved from Maryland, and the housing crisis had just crashed. We owed more on our house than it was worth. Uh, And in our first service here together, we were listening to the capital campaign to raise funds to build this building. And I thought, oh man, what have I gotten myself, what have I gotten us into here in Toledo, Ohio? But in God's goodness, we were able to pay off our house and we were able to be a part of this building project to have what we have here this morning. He provided all that we needed and allowed us to be a part of this. Now, many of you, I know, were ready to give more than what was necessary or expected. And I praise God for your generosity in your finances, in your time, in your prayers. This church has a body, and many of you individually have been generous in so many ways to me and my family, from welcoming us with loving arms, to caring for us through the loss of our first child, to challenging and encouraging us, to how you continue to care for my children, to how you've helped us with projects, to items you've given to us in our home. I could go on and on, right? But We praise God for your generosity to our family, and we love you for it. Thank you. But this morning, I want to challenge us in our generosity going forward. So this is the context of our passage. The Apostle Paul is writing to both encourage and challenge the church in Corinth. They'd previously made a financial commitment to help the church in Jerusalem. And for different reasons, the collection of this gift has not been completed, so the Apostle Paul is sending Titus to them to help them get this gift together so that their generosity can be seen by others 
and the church can be blessed by it. Now, I'm sure some of the problems of why this financial gift has not been completed related to the same problems that the Apostle Paul wrote about in his first letter to the Corinthians. See, a major issue was that they were suing one another within the church, okay? And another issue was that there was uh, undisciplined sexual uh, immorality going on, which is another example of selfishness. And so they were not clearly being generous within their own body, so how could they be generous outside? Now, what they were doing, these lawsuits and what they were not doing in disciplining sin were because of wrong attitudes in their hearts, wrong attitudes about what they thought they deserved, and thus a wrong attitude about God. The Corinthians were selfish with their possessions and with their bodies, and we're right there with them. We hold on tightly to what we have because we think we deserve this. We hold on so tightly to these things because they're fleeting. They go away so quickly. We think we have worked hard for this that, God, that we have been given, that we have, that we've done what was needed. So we should be able to have these things and enjoy them. Since these worldly things are so fleeting, they've gone so quickly, we don't want to share them with anyone else. We want them all to ourselves. Selfishness is the outpouring of being self-centered. The word I is the most important in any sentence. I need this. I need that. I can't do this for whatever reason we want to make up. Selfishness also revolves around the idea of losing control. What will happen if I give this away? If I do that, I won't have any control. Now, some of you may be thinking, Andrew, we aren't like the Corinthian church. We aren't doing those the same things. And we may not be doing the exact same things that they did, but our attitude about generosity is the same. Our selfishness is in direct opposition to the biblical principle of generosity. Now, the twin brother of selfishness is greed. Uh, Hollywood tells us greed is good. No. No. Greed is bad. Greed is terrible. It destroys. We want what we have only for ourselves, and because, again, these things are so fleeting, gone so quickly, we need more and more and more. The main corruption of American consumerism is that we're constantly bombarded and being told that what we have right now isn't good enough. So we need the biggest, the best, the flashiest, the newest thing, the best thing. I remember being in elementary school in Southern California and being caught up in the stupidity of what shoes other boys were wearing. This seemed so important at the time. For, young year old, for 10-year-old boys, it was like a status symbol of how cool you were, the sneakers on your feet. Ah, so dumb, so stupid. <clears throat> I always had shoes to wear. God always provided for us, for our family. I had what I needed. Yet that one year, as a 10-year-old, all I remember was wanting and thinking every day about a pair of Reebok pump basketball shoes. Some of you remember those? They had the basketball right on the tongue, and so you could pump them up. They had a little air pocket inside. You can pump them up. Well, if you were anybody as a 10-year-old boy in 1990, you had a pair of Reebok pump basketball shoes. Well, those were $80 for that pair of sneakers which 30 years ago was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money today. So as a family, we didn't have a lot of extra, but again, we had everything we needed. God provided, and God was generous. About 10 months later after this, for Christmas gift, my parents bought me a pair of Reebok pump basketball shoes. And oh man, how cool you thought I was walking to school that next day after Christmas break. I had my Reebok pump basketball shoes on. Do you think that joy continued very long? No. This is what happened. First, the coolness factor had changed. All the cool kids now had the new Nike Air Jordan tennis shoes, which were $120 a pair. So the Reebok Pump tennis shoes, those were old news. And as a 10-year-old active boy, about the fourth time I wore those shoes, what do you think happened? That air pocket burst. So now, after all those thoughts and desires, after all that coveting, what did I have to show for it? I had shoes that were uncool and ineffective. 
Our selfishness and greed always leads to this end of disappointment. They're unquestionable thirsts that will never be fulfilled. So selfishness and greed are the sinful outpourings of our lack of faith and submission to God. Our lack of generosity is tied directly to this lack of faith and obedience. We hold on to what we have so tightly and we want more because we don't believe that God will bless us. We don't believe what our passage says in verse 6, that those who sow bountifully will also reap bountifully. The literal Greek is sow with blessings, and you'll reap with blessings. And yet we act in the opposite way. We sow sparingly, but we want to reap bountifully. And our sinful thoughts are in exact opposition to what God's Word tells us. In fact, God's Word tells us through all Scripture that God owns everything. We think that since we've earned this stuff, we can do what we want with it, we can give to, what, to the things we want to give to, but we don't actually own anything. God owns it all. His blessing, His kindness, His generosity to us is why we have what we do. So when Psalm 50 says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, that doesn't mean He only owns those cattle on that thousand hills. It means he owes every cow on every hill. And he owns all that we have. And we own nothing. But since God owns everything, and he is a generous God, he gives us what we have for a time. We're born without anything. We can't take anything with us. But we've been given the blessings that we have from God. And God expects us to be good stewards of these gifts. Our sinful ideas of ownership and stewardship negatively affect how we do use what God's given us. And a proper biblical idea of stewardship, that these things aren't ours to begin with, that God wants us to use our resources generously, should affect how we do actually utilize these things. We're not owners of what we have, we're just stewards in the using of what God's given us. So I ask all of us, are we being godly stewards of the blessings he's given us? Are we being generous? Are we ready to give above expectation to others with what he's given to us? In verse 9 of our passage, the Apostle Paul quotes Psalm 112. This psalm is about the righteous man who gives generously because he is a steward of God's blessings. He's not afraid of the world. He's not afraid of losing control of what he has. He fears God, and he goes and sows bountifully. And the Apostle Paul tells us why we should be generous in our last verse. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You look throughout Scripture, and God gives generously to his people. He started in the garden with Adam and Eve, gave them generously all they needed. Sin entered, and through the fall, it brought pain, death, and hardship. And yet, God continued to be generous to his people. He chose them to be his. He brought them out of slavery. He gave them a new land. He gave them success in this land. And all throughout that, he continued to promise a Messiah who would redeem his people. And then he accomplished his promise in sending his only son, Jesus, to do this. God is the first giver of all good things. He gives us physical life, and by sending his son Jesus for us, by his grace through faith in Jesus, he's given us eternal life. And along with these other gifts are faith, repentance, these gifts, faith in Jesus as our Savior, forgiveness of our sins, repentance unto life. These are the indescribable gifts that God has given to us. Praise God. Amen? Amen. God is the giver of all good things, and he will supply all that we need. We see this expressed in verse 10 and 11. He'll give us what we need to sow and sow generously. Take a minute and think about all that God has blessed you with. Think about how you're using those things. The end goal that's mentioned here is important. It isn't our own wants and desires that are important. It's our righteousness and our generosity so that God may be glorified through these good deeds. He blesses us and allows us to bless others so that the glory is given to him in thanksgiving for what he's given us. In our sinful thinking, we want to be glorified by what we give. 
So you have buildings named after people who gave to make that building possible. Sometimes this is done out of respect, but more often it's because the person that gave that money, that donor, wants it to be known that they gave that. They want to be recognized for this thing. And this is co- very common at colleges and universities. I know many of you have seen this. See, people want to be glorified for their giving, but this isn't biblical generosity. Biblical generosity is not done for perks. There's no strings attached. Biblical generosity is where God is glorified through our giving to others. Biblical generosity is done to love our neighbor and to increase our faith in God as the giver of all good things. My grandparents on my father's side were missionaries in southern Mexico for over 40 years, uh, starting back in the 1940s. And for most of those 40 years, uh, they were on a very, very tight budget. Uh, And yet, as Americans, they were seen as very wealthy uh, in southern Mexico by the people that they ministered to. And so often, they would have people stop in and ask for personal loans of money. And at that time, it was customary for people to leave something of collateral. And often, the only thing that they had of value was a watch. And so they would leave a watch as collateral in saying that as a promise that they would pay back this loan. <clears throat> and when my dad was young, he asked my grandfather, why, why do you keep giving out these people? They never seem to come back and, and give their loan and repay their loan. And my grandfather said, you know, you can never outgive God. This was a phrase that was very common for my grandfather to use. And at the end of their life, as they're packing up everything and moving back to the U.S. after spending 50 years in in southern Mexico, my dad was helping unpack uh, all their stuff, and he came across a box of 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 my grandfather's possessions. You know what that box was? It was filled with watches. (laughs) My grandfather knew that most of these people would never be able to repay their loan, and yet he gave them it anyway. He trusted God and was ready to give more than what was expected because of his belief in God that God will provide for their needs and to do this generously. We can never outgive God. Our generosity is tied to our faith in a generous God. Now, generosity is also an act of defense against covetousness. If we're willing to hold on loosely to what we have, if we're ready to give above what's expected, we should be thankful for what we have been given. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the most to be thankful for and the most to give others. We shouldn't be looking at our neighbor's possessions in greed and lustfulness. Instead, we should be looking for ways to use what we have to bless others. This change of thinking is a way to actively fight the sin of covetousness. It's easy to fall into that trap of wanting what we don't have, but we look to the Lord in strength to fight these sinful thoughts And by being generous, by being ready to give more than expected for God's glory, it helps us in this fight. And we should be generous with all that God has given us. This starts with our pocketbook. We need to give back the first fruits of what God has given us. And the the generosity as an attitude of our hearts is an aspect of this. Tithing is one portion of this attitude of generosity. God's blessed us richly, and he allows us to be stewards of the 90%, and he expects us to give back the 10%. This tithe, this 10%, is used for the care of his church and his bride. And in the book of Malachi, God actually says to test him in this area. Look for how generous he will be for your obedience in this. But a heart of generosity goes beyond a tithe. But the 10% is the base expectation of God, and he expects us to be obedient. So if you aren't tithing, Start today and watch for God's generosity to you. An attitude of generosity affects all that God has given us. Money is just one aspect of that. It includes other things as well. Be generous with your time. People are often more willing to write a check and give money than they are to give time to something. Do you see your time as a valuable commodity? How are you using your time? See, a a selfish person often is stingy with their time. They see their time as precious. It's mine. I want to do what I want to do. A generous person gives his time to the Lord. I don't know how many times each week, each day, I continually fight thoughts. Ah, I don't have time for that. 
No, that's wrong. I do have time for that. I need to make time for that. God's church is important. People are important. My family is important. I need to make time for that. I need to be generous with my time. Be generous with your words. Men, I know we especially have a hard time with this. We're stingy with our words, aren't we? We're stingy with our words to our wives, to our children, to those around us. Husbands, have you told your wife how beautiful they are, how much you appreciate them? Women, wives, you need to be generous in the awards as well. When was the last time you told your husbands what you respect about him, what you appreciate about him? Fathers and mothers, do you take time to speak with each of your children each day? This might sound ridiculously simple, but it's vital for our homes that we're generous with our words. Children, how are you speaking to your siblings? When was the last time you wrote a note, a physical note, physical letter to somebody else? And generosity with our speech goes beyond our homes as well. Nothing is more generous with, that we can do than telling somebody about Jesus Christ, their need of a Savior, and what he's done for us. Are we being generous in this area of spreading the gospel with our mouths? And God calls us to be generous with all our talents. Are you ready to give above what's expected of what God's given you? Look around. Look at how many talented people we have in this church. God's allowed us to build this building here together, to worship together. He's blessed each person differently, and we can all find something that God has given to us to be generous with. Now, for us to be generous, we need to know about the needs of others. This requirement of knowledge is twofold. First, we must be looking for the needs of others to find ways that we can be generous with one another. Look for how we can be ready to give above what's expected with each other. This means we have to know each other's needs. We need to know these people. We need to know one another. It means getting into each other's lives. We like to spend time together. We spend an hour at least in the atrium together talking after the service, right? Are we generous with one another? Do we know our, our, the needs within this body? Do we know the needs of others outside this body? <clears throat> if we don't care for others, we'll never see a need and we'll never be able to be generous. Now, along with caring for one another is also communicating the needs that we may have to others. If you're here today and you have a need, please let somebody know about it. If it's a financial need, our church has a benevolence fund to use to help out in that area. We want to be able to be generous. Give us an opportunity to do that. Maybe it's something else. Maybe the need's not financial. Maybe it's help with a child. Maybe it's a project at your house, moving something, a ride somewhere, whatever it is. Allow God to be generous to you through us. Let us know. Tell somebody, a pastor, an elder, a church officer, a, 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 a small group leader. Let us know what your needs are because we want to be generous with one another. The generosity is an attitude of the heart. It's the public outpouring of our belief that God owns all things, that he will bless us for blessing others, and it's our ability, our physical ability, to show our love to others as well. Now, God also expects our attitude in how we're generous, not just what we're generous with. The generous man and woman is the most joyful. The most generous people I know are always, almost always the most joyful people. God, our, our scripture passage tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. Think about the last time you served someone else and how much joy came from that. You guys remember the video of the youth a couple weeks ago we saw? How much fun did those youth seem to be having in that stinky, dirty mess out there on Saturday? And God loves a cheerful giver and he supplies us, he gives us joy when we are generous towards him and others. Now, there is a cost to generosity. Generosity does take prior thought and planning. To be ready to give beyond what's expected, there must be prior thought and planning involved beforehand. It doesn't just happen on its own. As a good friend of mine, my, probably my closest friend said, life's expensive. <laughs> now, how are you planning to be generous? Are you thinking and looking for ways to use what God has given 
you to bless others. One way to do this would be to budget a portion of your resources, specifically to set it aside to be generous. Remember, we can never outgive God. Genera- generosity is generational. Biblical generosity starts with those that are closest with, but it goes beyond that as well. Are you cultivating a home of generosity? Because it is, generosity is both learned and taught. Your children will be generous because they see you being generous. My grandma Taylor, my mom's mom, uh, she and my grandfather owned a dairy farm up near Cadillac, Michigan. And my grandmother had six, six children. She worked very hard to keep a nice home uh, and helped out with the farm constantly. And my, rem- my mom remembers that when she was little, my mom's the youngest of six, she was little, my grandmother met uh, this poor family from the town. Uh, the family didn't go to church, but my grandmother reached out to them, and she volunteered to get up early on Sunday and go pick up their three children and bring them to church with their family. Now, often that would mean feeding them. It would often mean also buying additional clothes for these three children because they didn't have clothes. My mom remembers that my grandmother did this seven or eight years with this family. She would go and pick up these kids on Sunday, these children on Sunday, and bless them and bring them to church along with them. This stuck out to my mom. Now, I learned generosity from my parents as well. My my dad's seminary students, many of them were from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and on holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, they wouldn't have money to fly back home. So they would have these seminary students into their home, and it was a blessing to all of us. Generosity is generational, and it's learned and taught, and it starts with our homes. If if we're not willing to be generous within our homes, we won't be generous outside of it. Now, generosity is also contagious. When we are serving, it should have us think about how we can, when we are served, excuse me, it should have us think about how we can then serve. It creates additional generosity. And again, as followers of Jesus, we have the most to be generous with to others because of we serve a generous God, and he has been so generous with each of us. In our passage, the church of Macedonia was strengthened and encouraged because of the generosity of this church in Corinth. Our generosity strengthens and encourages others, and thus it also is contagious. So like the Corinthians, we've started something here. God's blessed us generously with what we have here. You've all been generous, but let's continue in this. Let's look for ways to serve those within our body and those without. Let's see the needs that we each have. As God continues to bring others here and we're able to spend more time with one another, let's fight covetousness, be joyful givers, and look to serve one another. We can't serve if we don't know the needs of each other. Let's be diligent to see the needs that we have and also communicate our own needs to others. Be generous with what you have and watch God bless you. We can never outgive God.